It's 8.52 here in New York. We understand that there has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. You're oh, my God. The, uh, that looks like a second plane. The skyline of New York is never again going to be the same. Most New Yorkers will not be the same, and this country will not be the same. Not in the history of this nation has such carnage been felt. There was an ethos that took hold that, you know, this terrible attack was a big threat to the country and that somehow we were all in this together, the government and the press. The response ought to be appropriate to what is, in fact, a second Pearl Harbor. The climate after 9-11 meant that if you spoke out against the calls to invade Iraq or the war on terror, you are committing career suicide. This is about good versus evil. This is about people who want to destroy us, our civilization, and our way of life. 9-11 basically created a world in which the United States was able to present itself as a force for good, fighting against this international axis of evil. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil. Behind that rhetoric is a reality which is filled with death and destruction for people in the Middle East, in Central Asia, and in South Asia. We need to put people on notice that if they harbor terrorists, they are going to get it from us. This legacy has been creating more terrorism, actually. And we've got a long way to go in order to achieve our objective. But America has no interest in fighting an endless war in Afghanistan. It's the war that enhances the conditions that produce what is supposed to eradicate. If we wanted to fight a war in Afghanistan and win it, I could win that war in a week. I just don't want to kill 10 million people. I know my decision will be criticized, but I would rather take all that criticism and pass this decision on to another president of the United States, yet another one. It's the war that can never really end. One did not have to be a visionary to realize on September 11, 2001, that the United States was about to change. A strike at the heart of the world's only superpower. Almost 3,000 American lives lost in a single day will have that effect. What was unforeseen was how many people in countries that had nothing to do with the 9-11 attacks have been affected by what the Bush administration called the war on terror. People who have never set foot in the U.S. have seen their own countries change, their own rights, freedoms, lives restricted. The invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq turned from temporary interventions into long-term occupations and were still dominating news cycles in 2021. Today, Taliban fighters took control of the capital, Kabul. It was a crusade, as President George W. Bush once called it. We've never seen this kind of evil before. But the evildoers have never seen the American people. It started with the White House forging alliances on the airwaves, in print, and in intellectual circles. One of the intellectuals who was brought into the White House to help frame the war on terror is Bernard Lewis. Bernard Lewis is famous for coining the term clash of civilizations. They want to turn this into a religious war, a war of Islam against what they see as the, the world of the unbelievers. Mm. And in the world of the unbelievers, obviously, the Americans come first. Another person who was brought in is Farid Zakaria, who at the time was the editor of the international edition of Newsweek. And if the war takes place and it goes well, which I think it probably will, um, you will also see at the end of this war that Saddam Hussein was indeed a murderous uh, tyrant. There will be stories, there will be evidence. And in that sense, you know, you will, you will, this war will look better in history perhaps than it does today. 9-11 uh, gave a new lease and a new life to Orientalist ideas and even Orientalist scribes. This Manichaean worldview of good and evil in a way allowed for the Bush's administration's notion of the Islamic world to replace actually the space that 
the evil empire of the Soviet Union had occupied before. And so the idea really was that it was the role of the United States to go in and civilize these people. And what these intellectuals did is they wrapped that up and made it palatable for the 21st century. It was a time when the lines separating American journalism from those in power faded away or was willingly crossed. November 29th, 2001 was a case in point. It is a day that has stuck to Fareed Zakaria and Robert Kaplan, a writer who worked for The Atlantic. Both attended a meeting organized by the Deputy Secretary of Defense, Paul Wolfowitz, a gathering of hawks planning a war and messengers who knew how to sell one. A brainstorming session that Kaplan now admits produced a forceful summary of pro-war arguments at the time. The most significant talking point of the meeting was that the United States had to find a way to change the regime in Iraq. In supporting the Iraq war, I failed my own test as a realist and have never ceased to remind my readers of that over the last 20 years. I attended no other meetings about the Iraq war. And it's correct to say that a meeting such as this one provided an intellectual veneer to the policy that emerged. What rankles me is that, with a few exceptions, the people who were writing robustly in favor of the war in Iraq. They're the editors of some of the most important publications in the United States right now. They're my friends. I don't want to single them out, but none of them paid a price. No, no one. I supported the war because I was a journalist who had gotten too close to my story. I had made several trips in the 1980s, and I had never experienced tyranny like I did in Saddam Hussein's Iraq. So I said to myself, what's worse than this? Nothing could be worse than this. Well, I found out in the years since the invasion that the anarchy in Iraq after Saddam fell was much, much worse than the tyranny under his rule. Whether caught up in a rush of patriotism or addicted to the ratings that rise when broadcasters bang the drums of war, too much of the American media bought into big lies on Iraqi WMDs, terrorist sleeper cells in the U.S., and Saddam Hussein's fictional links to Al-Qaeda. News studios were flooded with ex-military officers turned frontmen for weapons manufacturers, urging the U.S. to attack Iraq. Presented as experts, they were more like profiteers, and the Pentagon played a coordinating role in getting them on the air. Let's turn to retired General Joseph Ralston. Also joining me, General Bernard Trainer. He's a retired Marine Corps Lieutenant General. Retired Air Force Lieutenant General Tom McInerney, who is with us in our Fox News war briefing room. They were Beltway bandits, former Pentagon officials, who make out like bandits when they go into the private sector and then work for military contractors. This campaign is brilliant. It doesn't involve any collateral damage, no villages, no urban warfare. And it was a scandal that David Barstow of the New York Times uncovered. He brought in the minutes of these meetings between Rumsfeld and the military experts who were going on TV. It was a completely orchestrated program inside the Pentagon, giving talking points to the experts who would go on the media to shape public opinion. Anti-war perspectives were marginalized, in some cases censored. The New York Times was not the only US media outlet to turn into a conveyor belt for a false narrative. But because of its reach and influence, at home and abroad, it helped set the news agenda. Jill Abramson was the Times' Washington bureau chief. Chris Hedges' beat, at the time, was Al-Qaeda. The media was complicit in perpetuating this myth. You can't make a war on terror. That's a tautology. It's impossible. And yet we reacted, we drank from that very dark elixir of nationalism. You have to remember after the attacks of 9-11, the Bush administration 
uh, perpetrated on, on purpose this kind of fear. It's how they ended up passing the Patriot Act and the uh, 2002 Authorization to Use Military Force Act. So you had fear, but then you also had American chauvinism, and that was a very deadly mix that in essence blinded the New York Times as an institution. It wasn't just one or two reporters. Right after 9-11, I remember the director of the CIA, George Tenet, calling me. I was the Washington bureau chief for the New York Times. And on that call, it, enlisting my agreement that the Times would not do any reporting or disclosing of intelligence sources and methods. He just talked to the Washington Post and he ticked off the networks and everybody had agreed. And the Times ended up giving huge play to some seriously flawed news stories that were based on Iraqi defectors who turned out to have very little information of value about the current state of affairs in Iraq. In 2004, the Times published an editorial mea culpa of sorts, admitting that some of its coverage leading up to the Iraq war was not as rigorous as it should have been. It said editors who should have been challenging reporters and pressing for more skepticism were perhaps too intent on rushing scoops into the paper. The editorial ended with a promise to continue aggressive reporting aimed at setting the record straight. The U.S. military unleashed a massive series of airstrikes on Baghdad and other cities in Iraq, and it was both shocking and awesome as it was promised to be. The wave of patriotism swept the nation after the events of 9-11, so much so that journalists felt that they could not ask critical questions. CBS anchor Dan Rather, who went on The Letterman Show and he said, George Bush is the president, he makes the decisions, and, you know, it's just one American, um, wherever he wants me to line up, just tell me where, and he'll make the call. Talk about a media that have completely given up their autonomy. Fox News and Rupert Murdoch's empire was consistently in favor of the war on Iraq. In fact, all his editors, about 180 of them, all took a pro-war line in the lead up to the Iraq war. Once the war against Saddam begins, we expect every American to support our military, and if they can't do that, to shut up. Audiences were led to believe the Iraq war would be over in months, if not weeks. In the months ahead, our patience will be one of our strengths. That American troops would not end up mired there. Or in Afghanistan, which the U.S. invaded to hunt down Osama bin Laden and al-Qaeda and where, a decade after bin Laden's assassination, American forces remained. When the Biden administration finally ended the Afghanistan mission last month, American news coverage featured many of the same voices. Obviously, this is an unmitigated disaster. Columnists, D.C. pundits, and defense contractors that had advocated for the invasions and the subsequent occupations now arguing that the U.S. was leaving Afghans at the mercy of the Taliban and abandoning American interests. Where was the last time you saw Bin Laden? Where was the last time you saw Bin Laden? 9-11 also birthed a new generation of security-centric films and television shows produced to trade on fear. The Pentagon and the CIA have long had an informal, symbiotic relationship with Hollywood, supplying movie makers with military hardware, or turning the spy agency's headquarters in Virginia into a film set in exchange for state-friendly screenplays. Two months after 9-11, in November of 2001, 47 top Hollywood executives met with Bush advisor Karl Rove in Los Angeles to discuss patriotic plot lines the industry could craft. Rove later said it was about showing that the war in Afghanistan was not against Islam, but against terrorism. That distinction would be lost on most filmmakers, and eventually their audiences.
There was 24. It centered around a counterterrorism agent by the name of Jack Bauer. And every season is based on 24 hours of trying to avert this terrorist plot. Give me the name of the person besides the government who wanted Renee Walker dead. Jack Bauer is torturing people, sometimes killing them. But the audience is led to believe that he has no choice but to do all these horrific things. So that show was fantastically popular and played a very big role in terms of creating a terrorism mindset. You people are so stupid. Season four of the show 24 had an ad campaign with a Muslim family that looked very suburban. America's deadliest enemies are not behind enemy lines. They are living right next door. I can't even tell you the shock I felt when I saw that. I'm here to tell you that I think that many people die because of it. Foreign terrorists are operating on our soil. Drones are being dropped because we are dehumanized. Countries are invaded because we are dehumanized, because people do not have empathy with brown people. Homeland, which took over from uh, 24, ran from 2011 to 2020, and marked a shift from the kind of shoot 'em up cowboy narrative of 24 into Obama's smarter war on terror. All the Muslim characters are nefarious and terrible, except for one of the agents, who is an Iranian-American, who proves her loyalty by being extremely patriotic. But your current state of mind makes your loyalty to him and to the agency a very live issue. Tell the director not to worry. She's a good Muslim, right? It showed how cultural knowledge of the enemy, uh, good intelligence, and diplomacy were important in terms of winning the war on terror. Of course, it also justified extrajudicial killing. Uh, it justified torture and all the rest of it. So now you've got the Arab or the Muslim who is a CIA agent. But nobody stops and asks, well, hold it. You know, is this now humanizing us? Are you making us, you know, like everybody else? They needed Farsi speakers with experience in international finance. I had to help. Why can't we tell 10 movies about how damaging it was for American soldiers to be sent there, but not a single movie about how damaging it was for the people there? After 9-11, any uh, nuanced discussion of the Islamic world or what it means to be Muslim is uh, vanquished. And uh, what we get, in fact, are just these empty slogans and cliches that take the place of real understanding or knowledge. So uh, you get films like American oh, Sniper. I got eyes on the butcher. He's got the Shakes kid on the avenue. The entire premise of the film is that these people are terrorists who savagely attack innocents. They're not defending their own country from invasion. It feeds very pernicious stereotypes. There are very few films that actually show a nuanced um, portrayal of what contexts make terrorism possible. What drives young men to become terrorists? There are examples of a film by Moroccan director Nabil Ayush, Horses of God. There is the Palestinian film Paradise Now. It's not a coincidence that these films are not American. These films show the complexity of the socioeconomic and geopolitical climate that push certain young men into the hands of terrorist organizations. So I understand, of course, uh, films are a commodity, right? And these are multinational corporations that are interested in profit, and they want to produce what sells in a way. But oftentimes, it rhymes with the official discourse and narrative of the state. After so many years of unidimensional, reductive depictions of Arabs, Muslims, and the Middle East, audiences have been conditioned to expect 
certain kinds of bad guys. I stabbed him. The blood was just, it was warm. And it sprayed everywhere. Which may explain why the New York Times' award-winning podcast in 2018, Caliphate, was such a hit. The central character, who went by the alias Abu Huzaifdu, told the Times he was an Islamic State soldier and furnished the paper with tales of violence and barbarism. I had to stab him multiple times. And then we put him up on a cross and I had to leave a dagger in his heart. The podcast was downloaded millions of times, but the story turned out to be a hoax. Abu Huzaifa's real name is Shiroz Chowdhury. He is a fraud, a fantasist, who sold a fictional tale to Times reporter Rukmini Kalamaki, one she would eventually win a Peabody Award for. The paper was forced to admit it got it wrong, blaming an institutional failure. 16 years after acknowledging the failings in its post 9-11 coverage, promising to be more rigorous, the New York Times had done it again. But the podcast remains online with this disclaimer. The Times has concluded that the episodes of Caliphate that presented Chowdhury's claims did not meet our standards for accuracy. And the Times stood by Kalamaki, whose journalism has been called into question before, describing her as a fine reporter. So since Muslims are demonized, uh, it, it's, uh, it's very easy for the media to um, embrace stories, however false, that cater to that stereotype of Muslims. And the New York Times did precisely this when it put out the caliphate based on testimony given by an imposter. It was completely untrue, but it catered to that stereotype. It was lurid, it was salacious, it was audio snuff porn, people being crucified and stabbed in the heart. The blood was just everywhere. What the hell did I just do? I'm a psycho killer now. I didn't give him a chance to repent. I stabbed him. But because of the long uh, denigration of Muslims, with, both within popular culture and within the media, uh, it, be, it was believable. Those stereotypes that play on fear are an easy sell for the politicians, filmmakers, and news networks that acted as travel agents for the war on terror discourse. Political leaders the world over have adopted that language, in some cases have copied and pasted the legislation to surveil and ultimately silence their own opposition movements. I speak as someone who was always against the Saddam Hussein regime. I always wanted to see the end of dictatorship, but I, like many Iraqis, did not want to see the destruction of an entire society and the dismantling of institutions that took a hundred years to build. We did not have terrorism before 2003 in Iraq. We did not have car bombs. We did not have militias running around killing people. The war on terror and the atmosphere it created has generated so much unnecessary fear amongst so many citizens. So it's become a very convenient tool to completely crush any kind of legitimate political opposition. The fear narrative has become far more pervasive since 9-11. It was a terrifying event. The whole country watched thousands of people die on that day. But we remained in a perpetual state of, of fear. There were always new threats that were being played up. One of the key accomplishments, I think, of the war on terror is really to create a world that is a lot scarier in people's minds than it is in reality. What is really alarming for people who study the war on terror and who have a sense of the actual threat posed by Islamist or jihadist groups is the extent to which this threat has been overblown and overinflated, not just in the United States, but around the world, to justify uh, various coercive policies. Once you make people afraid, you can use that to justify 
stripping away basic civil liberties. Remember, we are the most watched, spied upon, photographed, monitored population in human history. And when your government watches you 24 hours a day, uh, you can't use the word liberty. That's the relationship of a master and a slave. And that is the real legacy of 9-11, the global one. Citizens persuaded by political leaders and news organizations to fear unseen enemies have surrendered some of their basic civil rights in the name of staying safe. In September of 2001, the Bush administration called the downing of the World Trade Center an attack on freedom. However, two decades later, we've come to realize that the actual sustained attack on freedom lies in so much of what has happened since. It is a war on dissent, dressed up, disguised as a war on terror.